It's a pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Danielle Zafir um, uh, to uh, to the our triospheric uh, seminar today. Um, she's an assistant professor in uh, CU's computer science uh, department, and also an affiliate professor uh, in the information science department, and a fellow of the Atlas Institute and the Institute of uh, Cognitive uh, Science, um, where she focuses on uh, on on visualization and and data science. Um, I think I became aware of uh, Daniel's work um, through an article that was published in EOS, I think, back in in May um, on on use of color in uh, geoscience uh, um, visualizations and and analysis. And and I thought, given that she's uh, here on campus uh, and and an expert, we should probably have her come down and. Uh, talk to us about uh, about how to use um, color and visualization both for for improved analysis of um, of our data sets and also uh, communication um, uh, to the academic uh, community and and also beyond so uh, I guess without further ado I'll uh, hand over to uh, Danielle take it away thank you Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction, Andy. And let me share my screen. I'm really excited to be here. You know, I've run into folks from time to time from uh, the Snow and Ice Data Center. It seems like you all are doing really interesting work. So I'm happy to share some of what, what we're working on. And I'd love to continue the conversations after as well, if there are ways that people see synergies between what we're doing in the lab and the kinds of problems and challenges you're running into in your own science. And in particular, um, I really am going to be focused broadly on this idea today that data is fundamentally changing the way we see and engage with the world. So over the past year, I think this has become especially salient where data is really a daily fixture in our public communications, driving everything from personal decision making to public policies that affect our everyday life. And data visualization is powerful because it provides a mean for everyone from scientists to humanists to everyday people with a means for readily exploring this data using our sense of sight and our own intuitions. So what I do is I explore how we can leverage the brain's ability to make sense of visual information in order to design novel tools for interactive exploratory data analysis. This is kind of my teaser buffet style subset of some of the work that's going on in the lab with a fantastic team of students and collaborators of whom you can see here. Uh, we work with stakeholders to help analysts in domains ranging from literary scholarship to biology to emergency response to make sense of their data and to guide more effective and efficient data exploration and decision making. So to motivate a little bit more about what we do, we've seen that data has become a pervasive fixture of modern life. In addition to conventional challenges around volume, we're also seeing challenges in terms of having new users, new data variety and complexity, and new questions that people want to try to tackle with their data. More and more people are looking to leverage data and graphs and charts have become a common fixture on the evening news to the point that we're seeing them in pretty much the same way we see our nightly weather map. Uh, but the growth of people with analysis needs is being far, or sorry, is far outpacing that of people with analysis backgrounds. So we're seeing more analysts, but we're also seeing fewer experts. We're also developing techniques to bring together data from different sources to try to enrich our perspectives in applications ranging from social media analysis to personalized medicine. And in bringing in new people and new data, logically, we're also getting new questions to be asked of that data. So some of you might be looking at these challenges and thinking, so what? Why can't we just compute the right answer and not worry about any of these problems? Why do people have to be involved at all? And while we've seen unprecedented advances in machine learning that offer powerful computational tools, the answer here is simple. We don't always know what it is we're looking for. And stats, while incredibly powerful, don't always give us the information we need. I'm going to illustrate this with actually a relatively simple example. So I've computed first order statistics on these four data sets. Would you say just kind of looking at them briefly that these look fairly similar? 
Hopefully most of you are probably saying, yeah, I would guess given these statistics are the same, these data sets are probably closely related. And there are probably some of you who are assuming I'm messing with you a little bit or I wouldn't be asking this question. Um, so all of these data sets have the same first order statistics. But when I visualize the data, they have qualitatively very different structures. And we can see that pretty immediately here. We have trends, constants with outliers, parabolic structures. We have words to describe how this data behaves. And if I tell you these words, you'll get a pretty good sense of what I mean, because we qualitatively understand these differences, even if we can't always readily enumerate them. So what's going on here? How do we build knowledge from data visualizations that we can't with statistics? I'm going to focus just on these two scatter plots to try to explain this. So the process of interpreting data happens over time. It starts with our sense of sight. So for example, light from the red and the orange points goes into the eye, fires off a set of signals to start with the process of interpreting this information. Lots of magic happens. And at the end of these processes, we reach the far side of the spectrum, which is insight, the knowledge that we generate through these visualizations. For example, one insight we might infer from this data is that while these data sets have identical statistics, they have qualitatively different shapes that we can describe as linear or parabolic. But how do we actually get from point A to point B? How do we get from sense of sight to insight, from structures and patterns to knowledge? What is it that actually is happening in between? Well, by understanding the perceptual and cognitive processes between sight and insight, we can start to really understand how the ways we visualize data determine the knowledge that people can infer from that data. So my work models how people generate knowledge from visualization and uses these models to create new tools and techniques for analyzing data. Our process overall generally consists of three phases. The first involves discussions with domain experts to identify what problem they're trying to solve and what are the current limitations and existing approaches. We then move from there to phase two, where we're conducting empirical studies to model how we can optimize our representations based on the needs and context of our target analysis problem. And we can use this data to drive new algorithms for supporting interactive data exploration. Once we understand what does the user need, what are they doing, we can embody these models and approaches in interactive exploratory analysis systems. We develop tools and work with stakeholders to iterate on these tools to try to optimize our solutions for a particular data challenge. So we've applied this process across a broad variety of applications, and I'm going to focus today on three specific problem areas that kind of illustrate the process that we use to visualize data. So the first of these, automated effective encoding design is a problem that pervades across domains and it's one Andy alluded to in the introduction. This is where I'll spend probably the most of my time today. Uh, but the second of these challenges is in collaboration with the US Air Force, where we're coupling visualization and interactive machine learning to build applications for remote sensing. And the final thread explores how we can bring together all sorts of different devices, including augmented reality, mobile data, cloud computing, and an idea called immersive analytics, where we're embedding and situating data into the physical world to support situated data analysis and field operations across both earth science and emergency response. So to start off, designing effective visualizations is a really tricky problem. It's something as simple as choosing the right colors requires understanding how people perceive colors, how the semantics of color align with data, how the relationships between colors highlight key patterns, and if that wasn't already enough, also choosing colors that just look good together. And this is really critical as color is amongst the most important and common methods for encoding data. It's not only pretty, our brains are actually really, really good at synthesizing color. So in some of the work I did with my dissertation, not gonna jump into that today, but we constructed some of the systems on the left where we use color to increase the scalability and visualization by tenfold or more across a range of applications in biology. But we see color used in all kinds of visualizations from scatter plots to surfaces to maps and beyond. As I mentioned though, color is kind of hard to do right. Poorly designed color encodings may not just look bad, but they can lead to misinterpretation and even have caused papers to be withdrawn from high tier journals like Nature and Science. Uh, some research that was done several years ago with doctors showed that effective color choices can actually improve diagnosis rates by 30% or more. So getting color right is pretty important. But it's also really hard to do. So two of the biggest things that make color encoding hard are that we don't have good models for mapping our color differences to data differences. And 
even with the models we do have, using color well currently requires substantial design expertise. So in collaboration with several students and researchers at Tableau, IUPUI, and LANL, what we're doing right now is we're trying to figure out how to better model and understand what it means to use color well to drive algorithmic solutions that will help people generally use color more effectively. So a lot of my work in this space fits into two primary threads. How do people see color in visualization and how do we design algorithms that help people to use color more effectively? So much of my work in this space has been very methodological, focusing on how we can model the ways people perceive colors in viz. So the basic idea behind a lot of this is we are trying to use empirical data to probabilistically model how precisely people can discern color differences across different visualizations and across a wide range of viewing conditions. For folks who've ever been reading an article or trying to interpret a visualization and walk from inside to outside, you know what a pain it can be when your environment changes in terms of being able to see what's going Going on on your device. Um, so we've got a lot of work in this area. I'll dive into just a little bit of it at a high level of detail, but again, totally happy to find uh, time to chat offline. Um, but the, the key motivator behind why we're doing a lot of this modeling is to figure out how do we put that into practice? How do we drive action? So once we figure out how people see differences in color, we can start to think more globally, developing metrics and algorithms for choosing sets of colors that effectively communicate properties in data. For example, we know rainbows generally not great, generally not good, a good idea to use a rainbow color map for a number of reasons. But we did some work with collaborators with IUPUI where we actually found that rainbows are really good for allowing us to infer which of a set of data sets comes from a different data distribution. And it turns out you can generalize those results to figure out different metrics like color name space and color name distances that allow us to better generalize this idea of how do we build metrics that tell us what colors are good for different sets of tasks. So I'm not gonna jump into any more details on that project, but what I'm gonna instead talk about is some of the work that was touched on in the EOS article, which is focusing more on the algorithmic side, exploring how we can use data mining practices to bootstrap encoding design. And all of this research is going to fundamentally build off of the color space called CIE Lab. So visualization has historically used CIE Lab rather than RGB as a mathematical space to map data to color. Lab consists of three axes, lightness, the amount of blue, blue and yellow, and the amount of red and green um, that try to mimic what the eye is doing when it's making sense of color. So we use lab for visualization as unlike RGB, it's approximately perceptually linear. That is one unit of Euclidean distance approximately corresponds to one 50% just noticeable difference or J and D. And this J and D is critical because it's the smallest color difference that people can reliably distinguish at a rate greater than chance. So CIA lab, this one-to-one -one mapping gives us a nice correlation between data differences and color differences, which is critical for effective data analysis and in practice fails absolutely miserably. So let me show you what I mean by that. Um, so CIA lab states that we should be able to see seven different color categories here. And there is no need to adjust your monitor. This expectation just simply does not pan out in practice. So what designers have done over the years is they have handcrafted color encodings and hand-tuned color sets for data representation, building on their own intuitions and experience and employing these models as heuristics to craft better encodings, essentially through heuristic and intuition. But these codings even begin to break down as we change the size of our marks, or as we change the visualizations that we're using. So in visualization, we wanna balance discriminability, which is our ability here to, imp to preserve important data differences with the range of desired data differences. And the way that we're going to do that is by understanding how do the colors we see map to the differences that we see in our data. So to achieve this goal, uh, we designed a data-driven method to proactively anticipate how color difference perceptions change as a function of the visualizations that we use. Uh, that is, we wanted to try to create models that allow us to match the differences we see in colors to the differences that exist in our data. 
So we developed three different models using this approach. The first focusing on diagonally symmetric marks and scatter plots, the second on elongated marks and bar charts, and the third on asymmetric elongated charts in line graphs. In total, this resulted in about 34,000 data points that we used to seed models that try to predict how well people are able to distinguish colors across different visualization types. For the sake of time, not going to dive into the nitty gritty of these methods. I am totally happy to geek out about it after after the talk, uh, but I do want to jump straight to these key takeaways of what we found. So these studies show that our abilities to perceive differences in data encoded by color vary according to the design of our visualization. So our abilities vary systematically by mark size and shape, with our abilities improving both as marks get larger and as marks get longer. One of the other interesting pieces here is that the gain by making marks longer, let's say by making our bar chart marks taller, is actually um, asymptotic. After about a two to one ratio, you don't get much benefit from making your mark longer. But the reason that we care about this is that these differences are not subtle. They're actually quite dramatic. What we find if we compare to our traditional visualization metrics, 70% of our predicted data differences don't actually pan out. People can't see them. Um, but if we tailor our models to the kinds of marks we have, we can actually gain back about 30% of that encoding space. The one really cool bit with these results is just how cleanly we can actually make these predictions. We can compute normalizing constants using the ranges of allowable mark sizes that we've allowed our visualization to use and plug these constants into our Euclidean distance formulation to predict with honestly a very high degree of precision how well people will discern color-coded data. So we have models, we have data. How do we use these models? Well, one of the ways that we can use these models is to evaluate our own visualization practices and understand where current ap approaches might be falling short. So you'll recall that I talked about how designers can hand adjust for the shortcomings of CIA Lab. And most color in visualization comes from a tool called Color Brewer. These are hand designed. My guess is many of you have seen these in your mapping and visualization activities of your own. Some of the most trusted and reliable uh, color encodings that we have for visualization. It really is the gold standard for choosing color well. We can use these data-driven models to predict how well color brewer encodings might work given the minimum parameters of a visualization. For, a for example, imagine we have scatter plots with 10 pixel wide points, four pixel thick lines. These are the standard uh, sizes on Tableau on a 15 inch laptop. So we wanna see, are we going to be able to see our nine categories of difference in our brewer ramps with these kinds of more standard encoding designs? So we took the 18 nine-step sequential brewer ramps, plug them into our models. These ramps are designed for cartography, so we want to see do these translate to other kinds of visualizations. And when we actually looked at do our models predict that these ramps will be discriminable, what we found is that 13 of the 18 nine-step sequential brewer ramps actually failed to preserve color difference for these visualizations. So what this tells us is that we do need to consider mark aware models and encoding design. We're actually losing much of the fidelity that we assume even in expert crafted designs due to our assumptions about discriminability that are embedded in a lot of these conventional models that have historically driven design. So this is kind of a major problem. It suggests we need to rethink the ways that we craft our color choices. And designers have this fine tuned sense of how to build good color, but even if they don't have it right yet, what are the rest of us to do? It's really, really hard for the vast majority of us to generate colors with high perceptual and aesthetic quality. Uh, I can confidently say that even after 10 years of working with color, my ability to hand generate color encodings is uh, about the same level as what I see in my toddler's finger paintings. So it's a really, really tricky problem, even though it feels like it should be so simple. So what is the average visualization user to do? Or to put this more simply, how do we choose the right colors for our data, especially as the data grows in both size and complexity? Well, one thing we can do is we can apply the models that we've constructed to proactively fix encoding challenges and encourage effective visualizations, support experimentation, and even do some post hoc correction. So for example, if we have the red blue color map we see here, we say we like the way this works, we like how it looks on our scatter plot, but let's say we have to map it to smaller points, we may lose important differences as we shrink our visualization down. But 
we can use our models to anticipate when this loss of fidelity will happen, push apart the ends of our encoding, and then reinterpolate the encoding to preserve uniformity. Likewise, if our visualization fundamentally changes, we go from a scatter plot to a bar chart, we can use our metrics to pull our colors back together and make better use of the available encoding space and allow room for more aesthetic choices. So this approach is great if you have a solid baseline map that you want to start with. But selecting from a set of predefined maps and color choices can lead to a little bit of deja vu. So you can see this is a menagerie of visuals selected from the 2018 proceedings of the visual analytics track of the top data visualization conference. And you can see we use color encoding a lot and maybe rely a little bit more heavily than we realized on can ramps created by others like color brewers. In fact, during the survey, what we found is about 25% of papers from that track's proceedings contained at least one visualization with a red blue ramp. So this might cause your visualization to get lost in the crowd. Even if you're okay with your vis not standing out, there are situations where you need unique colors. For example, if we're working on branded presentations, we may need to use the colors that are associated with that brand, but there's not exactly a ton of demand out there for a lift pink ramp. And likewise, we might have color semantics that we need to bind to in order to ensure consistent communication. So what do we do? Well, this problem leads us to the challenge that we tackled in this work, which is how do we actually create effective color ramps? So we developed an algorithm that lets you create high quality color ramps using just one single guiding color. We accomplished this by computing characteristic structures and designer ramps in a perceptual color space, and then applying those ramps to a given color to generate a set of ramps with different visual characteristics that developers can then select from and refine. So to motivate this a little bit, I want to take a step back and show you kind of the, the two ends of color ramp design methods that we have from visualization. So we have on the one side, tools that offer us predefined palettes like Color Brewer that allow for full user control or that allow for very little user control, but full guaranteed good design practice. Uh, on the flip side, we have tools that allow for full user control like Photoshop or here we have a tool called Color Picker for Data. Um, so what Color Picker for Data will do is it will allow you to choose two endpoints and it will interpolate a color ramp between them in a perceptual space. So Color Brewer is absolutely fabulous if they have what you need, if there is a ramp there that matches your needs. But what you see really is what you get. On the other hand, tools like Color Picker for Data over here on the right provide a lot more agency to the user. You can choose two endpoints in this space, any two endpoints you like. But if we look at what the interpolation between those endpoints does in practice, we'll often find the results are somewhat underwhelming. So here I've taken the endpoints of a brewer ramp and interpolated them using this linear method, this linear cut through a perceptual space. And what you can see is that the colors are pretty dull. They fall a little flat. They don't have that same vibrancy and aesthetic appeal of the hand design ramp. So in other words, our color maps are just not as good as the quality of their endpoints. There is something more going on to color encoding than just choosing good base colors to work with. And this gets to all of the interesting and nuanced recommendations we have for building effective color maps. So here's a set of 17 best practices from a recent survey exploring decades of color use in biz. However, Color ramp design is hard. It combines, like we said, aspects of perception and aesthetic in ways that have to play nice with each other. And many of these concepts are heuristics that require substantive design expertise to apply effectively. So in the interest of assuming not everyone is a professional designer, I'm going to remove the guidelines that fall in this heuristic category and leave only the concrete mathematical guidelines. Now that I have these, you might start to notice that a lot of these are really hard to implement at design time without substantive expertise in color science. So for folks who are not familiar and intimately familiar with complex color models, we can go ahead and remove those constraints as well. And here's the results. So hopefully now you're seeing a little bit of why creating ramps is so hard. And even if you have the expertise to follow these practices, We've actually found that in practice, designers don't really follow many of these rules. These are rules of thumb, but they're very, very, very frequently broken. So what do we do? Well, we instead turn to a design mining approach. And so this is an approach that uses data mining to model and reproduce design practices. And we're doing this in order to try to capture the properties of effective color use in bids. 
So our algorithm relies on a fundamental observation that ramps are essentially just curves through a 3D space. So we assert that the structure of these curves controls the aesthetic appearance of the ramps and the ways we sample the curve control the perceptual properties of the ramp. So one thing you'll notice in this talk is that these curves, as I said, they traverse the 3D volume, but if you try and look at the 3D structure of these curves on a 2D display, it, it just kind of is a little brain melty. So what we've done is I'm gonna show all of these curves as 2D projections, one in our AB hue plane and one in lightness chroma, just for the sake of this talk. So our algorithm consists of six steps that can be roughly categorized into three phases. So the first two steps create a uniform training corpus we can use to derive our models. The second two cluster the curves based on their structural properties and compute characteristic structures describing each cluster. And the final pair take these clusters from an abstract space and anchor them to color space to generate our encodings. I'm gonna walk through each of these at a very high level here, but as always happy to dive into the details after the talk. Um, so we assembled a corpus of 222 handcrafted color ramps from known sources in the community, including color lovers, Tableau, R, and Color Brewer to try and ground our models. Once we had this collection, we manually curated the set, removing any duplicate ramps or ramps that contain perceptual discontinuities that are known to introduce misleading patterns in visualizations. Since we drew on a variety of sources, we had the unfortunate outcome that our ramps had vastly different number of colors. So treating the colors in the ramp as control points, what we did is we fit interpolating B splines, so the curves you see here to the control O points, and then used arc length interpolation to resample the curves to a uniform number of points along roughly equidistant intervals. So we get roughly perceptually uniform samples. Once we normalize these curves, we clustered them according to their physical structures. Um, I'm not going to dive into the technical details about the clustering algorithms, but what you can see here to summarize all of this is the 2D projected plots of many of these curves in gray. And the basic idea is that we can align these curves by moving, rotating, and reflecting them to minimize the overall distance between control points, and then use either a k-means clustering algorithm based on structural features of each curve or a Bayesian clustering algorithm that uses what are called elastic shape descriptors to group the curves curves that share similar structures. Once we've done this grouping, we compute a characteristic curve describing what kind of the mean ramp structure of each of these clusters looks like. And um, this will give us a set of nine models per algorithm that capture general characteristic design patterns used in our handcrafted ramps. So as you can see from these plots, pretty much all of our curves are far from these linear uniform structures that are represented by design heuristics or tools like color picker for data with the straight line interpolation. Um, you only see that happen in this small set of curves that are up here in the upper left of the display. Instead, characteristic curves are actually much more accurately characterizing really nuanced and diverse shapes that designer encodings traverse in these color spaces. So once we have our characteristic curve, we can then apply that curve to generate a ramp by adjusting the curve according to the relative lightness distribution. So basically we start with the curve positioned according to the mean model of lightness. We then find the point in our lightness curve that is closest to our desired color. And we shift the ramp such that we minimize lightness variation from our original model. We then anchor that resulting ramp in color space and we get a new color encoding. So we tested this approach in three different ways. We conducted a replication study where we attempted to replicate designer ramps using our approach. We also stress tested the approach by seeding it with a designer selected set of what they called ugly colors to show that this technique is fairly robust to color choice. And finally, we conducted a formal study with professional designers to evaluate the perceptual and aesthetic characteristics of our ramp. So details about the first two studies or first two methods in the paper. I'm going to touch just very briefly on the experimental evaluation that we conducted. Um, so we started by pseudo randomly seeding 25 color ramps using the models generated from our K-means and our Bayesian clustering algorithms. And we compare these with two baseline approaches. Uh, so the curves generated in our um, and our technique are shown here. So the first of our baselines is a linear interpolation approach like we see in Color Pecker for Data and other current tools. We basically linearly interpolate between two colors that are at least 40 units of lightness apart and that were selected from our designer corpus. We then also used a random selection of 25 ramps from our designer corpus as our second baseline. So this is kind of our high performance baseline. And this gives us a theoretical threshold for what we expect out of a high quality ramp. 
we use these ramps in a series of visualizations where participants basically trying to figure out what color matches to which value. So a pretty simple task overall. Um, this matching task allowed us to test the perceptual discriminability of the ramp. And we paired this task with an aesthetic question, asking participants to select how pleasant they found the colors to be overall. And so we conducted the study with three different visualization types, scatter plots, heat maps, and choropleth maps, and then our four ramp types. Um, we tested this in a three by four within subject study with each participant seeing nine ramps from our four ramp types, and the ramps totally counterbalanced between participants. We ran the study with 35 designers that were from the US, UK, India, and China with an average of 6.2 years of self-reported professional design experience. And to get to the chase, here is what we found. Um, so we've grouped our results in terms of both the perceptual and the aesthetic measures. So our approach in all of these graphs is in green and our baselines are in blue. So for our perceptual measures, we found that participants were more accurate with our approach than with linear ramps and actually trended towards being more accurate with our approach than with designer ramps. So the difference wasn't quite statistically significant. Uh, we found the same pattern again here with aesthetics. Participants preferred our approach to linearly interpolated ramps and found our models to be at least as aesthetically pleasant as handcrafted designer ramps. So the takeaway here is that for these visualizations, we found that an expert designer participant pool found ramps generated using our approach and pseudorandom colors comparable to that, to those uh, handcrafted by designers. So this gave us some evidence that this approach actually might work. We embedded these models in a color encoding design tool called Color Crafter that provides a front end for this algorithm. So what this tool does is it allows people to manually specify target colors to generate a series of ramps. They can manipulate those ramps as you're seeing here by adjusting and applying a sequence of affine transforms, translating, rotating, scaling, and reflecting these curves along various axes in color space. And these kinds of transformation-based edits allow users to really quickly customize their encodings, map them to the colors and the FX that they want without sacrificing the quality of the resulting ramps. And we found that even novice visualization designers and developers, and even um, some of the students who are who were working on this tool who are colorblind, were able to generate designer caliber ramps really, really quickly using this approach and a single guiding color. So where do we go from here? Well, one challenge that has come up in discussions with geologists and others in earth science that I'm currently collaborating um, with some folks at Ceres and Lanel on is how drastically different color maps can change the kinds of structures that we see in data, especially in the earth sciences and the geosciences where we have so many different um, data sets and data sources and heterogeneous data that we need to be able to layer onto each other. So we're currently exploring how we can interactively infer the parameters of an ideal encoding choice by mining user preferences between different color map designs on their own data using Bayesian optimization. Think about this as you load in your data, you generate your map, and you can iteratively choose between different pairs of visualization choices. And what the algorithm in the back end is doing is it's triangulating what is the best map that shows you what you're looking for in your data. So we're also exploring alternative methods for using statistical models of visualization viewing and automated settings. So things like the color models that we saw, we're looking at, can we expand those models and those approaches beyond color to really get a quantitative sense of how well do people perceive different patterns in different visualization designs? So I had a career proposal recommended recently that will allow us to investigate how these statistical models can actually support automated design inference to allow real-time estimation of the effectiveness of different designs for particular sets of tasks. So hopefully it's gonna be fun, some fun stuff coming around over the next few years here. So I wanna briefly touch on another aspect of my research moving away from the color space, which is how do we help people use algorithms to effectively analyze data at scale? So while algorithms are incredibly scalable and efficient, people ultimately make and are accountable for the decisions made with data. They have expertise and knowledge of context that can't easily be integrated into algorithmic decision-making. And much of the ongoing work in my group explores how we can design visual analytics tools for collaborative human machine learning analytics. So a lot of this work is still ongoing. Um, so I'm just gonna touch on this very, very briefly, but I wanna touch on a bit of the work in the space that we have published to date. 
Uh, so the, the motivating problem for this line of work is really in remote sensing. So the Air Force is getting data from satellites arrayed all over the world. We're getting new updates every 15 seconds. In that data, we're searching for two to five pixel blocks that move in such a way to suggest a potential threat. And this data is just way too big to be visualized all at once. However, since we don't have much ground truth data and the risk here of getting things wrong is so high, we saw that a few years ago, for example, when the text message alerts went out in Hawaii that there was a threat and people needed to take cover, um, we don't wanna automate away a solution either. So what we're trying to do is instead combine insights from people and insights from algorithms and have those two sources of information, those two processes work together in ways that provide enough transparency for meaningful and accountable decision making. So a couple of questions that we're exploring this particular line of research are things like, how do we actually get the right information from the analysts in limited resource environments? We might have tons and tons and tons of data, but a person, an expert, only has so much bandwidth. So our algorithm is very scalable, our person is very smart. And the question is, how do we optimize and balance the skills of those two teammates in meaningful ways? And so we've been looking a lot into different weighting schemes that allow us to try to figure out how do we push and pull information, integrate information effectively for this kind of semi-automated collaborative decision making. The other direction that we're looking is thinking about the human side of things. How do the ways that a system might present the choices they make influence an analyst trust and behavior. So for example, we have some work in prep right now that I'm really excited about that looks at how do the kinds of questions we ask people, if we ask only if we're super confident or if we ask only if we're super unconfident, and how do we show the confidence in the algorithm? How do those kinds of presentations actually affect how willing someone is to disagree with what's going on in an algorithm and to disagree with the recommendations that are being made. And one of the cool things that we've seen is that you can take the exact same data and your agreement will change drastically depending on how you present the system's predictions and how what kinds of predictions you choose to present in the first place. Um, but I want to talk about another aspect of this kind of system facing explanation that can shift people's perceptions of data in ways that change action and change confidence. Uh, so when we think about data analytics, we think about something like this. We think about getting a complete error free data set. It's highly reliable, highly trustworthy, and unfortunately also pretty much a unicorn in the real world. Um, when you get a data set, it's often closer to this. Real data sets are messy and imperfect, and these imperfections can inhibit visualization analysis and interpretation. So what we can also do is we can have the system try to infer what should go into these missing or messy or erroneous data points. Can we have the system try to automatically clean up our missing values in our data visualization? But the question is, after we do that, how do we show these values? And what's the right way to think about inferring these values in the first place? Is it even worthwhile to estimate? And should, once we estimate it, should we highlight the estimated points? Or should we downplay it? Or should we do something different? So what we did in this particular line of work is we ran an experiment to explore how the ways we choose to estimate and represent data values shift our perceptions of that data and the conclusions that we draw from it. We were looking in particular at two different methods for trying to present system estimated data. Uh, so we're looking at the visualization techniques. So how do we show the data points that were inferred? And we're looking at imputation methods. How do we compute the data points that were inferred? And in total, we looked across a whole range of methods we've seen in different visualization systems, things like highlighting the points, making them bright red, saying, hey, error, error, we're just guessing here downplaying our missing values to make them less salient than real data using things like outlines or sketching, um, annotating these values with additional information such as the likely range of values, the likely range these estimated values might fall in, and alternatively just leaving it out, just saying, hey, this data is missing, we're just gonna keep it missing, the system's not gonna try and do anything. Um, and we looked across a range of common imputation methods for replacing these missing values as part of this investigation. 
when we were running the experiment, we were really interested not only in objective performance, but also subjective impressions, things like how confident are you, how credible is the data, how complete is the data, how reliable is it, things that might affect our decision making in practice. And one of the things that we found is that things like adding uncertainty or adding bright red blinking error People thought that was actually really high quality, really confidence inducing, very reliable data. Whereas if we remove the data or we showed it as sketchy or outline, we kind of downplayed it. People actually saw that as being low data quality, something they didn't trust as much, they didn't have as much confidence in. And if we look at this pattern of representations, what this is telling us is that visual encodings that break the visual continuity of the data, that is they reduce the salience of missing values in ways that might cause us to group the present data actually resulted in lower performance and lower perceived quality. So we're hypothesizing that grouping like this causes people to treat these groups as separate units and kind of try to merge these estimates, which makes analysis more difficult and causes people to be less confident in their conclusions, less confident in the data overall, and also to make more mistakes. But the key takeaway from the study is that the ways that we present data that's been provided, that's been inferred by the system, manipulate how people perceive data and manipulate the confidence in the conclusions drawn with that data. And this can come into play in a variety of applications we're exploring, which relate to this idea of human in the loop. So the basic idea when I'm talking about human in the loop is that an algorithm is going to start off chugging through a whole lot of data. It's going to trip across something it wants some help on, ask the, ask the analyst for some support, and then it's going to update its own process based on the updates that are provided by the expert, turn around, rinse, and repeat. Um, there are, when we're designing systems for this kind of process, this kind of workflow, we have a number of different design choices that need to go into our system. Things like the query policy. How do we know when to ask for help and how the kinds of questions we ask for help on might shift what the analyst does with the data and how much they're willing to trust the machine learning process. We also have query weight. So we've done some work investigating how much do we trust the algorithm versus how much do we trust the analyst and whose inputs do we want to prioritize in the prediction task. And finally, like we just talked about, the visualization. How does the information that the system provides to the analyst support the analyst's overall decision making, um, support the whole process of understanding what's really going on in the data, and support their confidence and trust in the machine learning process? To one extent, we don't want people to be so skeptical in the machine learning that they don't do anything with it at all. And to another extent, we don't want them to be so trustworthy that they trust it blindly. So how do we understand how the ways that we manipulate these three design factors lead to an appropriate level of skepticism on the part of the analyst in terms of their decision making process? So we've been exploring and working on how these ideas might fit into um, a number of tools. And so here is a tool for remote sensing that I hinted on in our motivating problem for this part of the talk, where what we're doing is having the machine learning algorithm process a whole variety of remote sensing targets compute physics-based properties of the images that they're seeing and then bring those physics-based properties and that additional information forward to the analyst. And what I wanna especially call attention to is this graph here in the lower right. What this graph does is it allows the analyst to see in real time what the machine learning algorithm thinks this target is. So in this case, what kind of cloud do we think we're, we're seeing here based on its, its motion patterns and its physical patterns? And then to provide input on what the analyst is the expert thinks is going on. So the analyst can say, I'm pretty sure it's not cumuliform four, I'm pretty sure it's cumuliform zero. And what the algorithm is then going to do is based on the weightings of how much it trusts itself versus how much it trusts the analyst, it's going to update its prior distribution to try and make a better prediction of what it, think it thinks is going on in real time. And the takeaway for this is that consistently across ranges of expertise, we found that we get about 10 to 15 second frame updates for this paired human machine classification than if we were to just use the human alone or if we were just to use the algorithm alone. And so what this translates to for expert uses that were classifying the targets about three minutes earlier, or in other words, a 40% improvement in overall classification and convergence in simulation. So we're, we're just getting started on phase two with us, trying to figure out what happens when we start to give this to real users. Do we see the same kinds of speed ups that we see in simulation? And that leads us into our next steps where we're iterating 
thing on this basic idea of how do we couple human and machine learning in remote sensing applications to enable accountable, explainable, and editable decisions? How do we really make sure that the analyst has a handle on what's going on? Um, and we're also exploring this in the context of qualitative analysis. So can we actually model the rich expert intuitions that emerge when somebody is qualitatively analyzing a text corpus and have that machine learning algorithm act as the collaborator to allow the analyst to scale up and direct their limited attention to larger and larger data corpora. Right. So we want to basically be able to enable detailed, close reading, highly expert driven analysis on a large scale, on a big data scale. So with that, I want to go into the last line of my work, which is going to kind of take us away from this idea of traditional analysis on the desktop and really start to think about what happens when we put data into the context that the data describes and into the context where actions are actually happening. So to set the stage for this a little bit, when we think about data analytics, we typically think about something like this, someone sitting in front of their laptop, working on a traditional business intelligence or mapping software, but increasingly we're moving into a world where we have the possibility of working together with data in scenarios like this. So this is an example of what we would call immersive analytics. We're using AR, VR, or physical objects to actually embed and situate data in the real world. And so our motivating problem for jumping into immersive analytics is this idea of field data analysis. So data is removed from the spatial and temporal context it describes. We see the spreadsheet. We know the spreadsheet is a number of measures. We might have a little bit of knowledge of what these numbers are supposed to describe. But at the end of the day, the data is just a sample of what's going on in the real world. For example, it might be a sample taken from a field site where you have a dynamic wildfire situation like we see in this image here. So this line of work is really trying to ask that question of how can we integrate data back into the context they describe to try to increase situational awareness and decision making. And so our work in the space again is kind of exploring this two pronged approach of how do we understand the perceptual elements, what do people see and how do we design more effectively and the visual and the, sorry the systems based elements of how do we put those lessons that we learn from perception and cognition and empirical work into practice. So in particular we've been looking at a range of studies where we are trying to figure out what does it actually mean to effectively situate data in the real world to have data appear at the places it, it's supposed to appear and also to understand how can we actually effectively design for or augmented and virtual reality. It turns out, as we'll get to in a second, the ways that we perceive our data encodings and the guidelines and best practices for two-dimensional visualization on a desktop may not translate as well as we'd like to immersive spaces. Um, on the flip side of this, we're exploring these ideas to build applications across a range of domains that all seek to figure out how can we take data off the desktop and put it into the locations where we get the benefit of that context, we get additional information, and we can act on that information in situ. There's no spatial gap between where the data is collected and where the analyst can act on it. And so we've also looked at this in other applications. For example, you can see here some work that was done in collaboration with NREL looking at how can we help people understand hydrogen fueling in the context of data storytelling. So to start off with the encoding part, part of what makes immersive analytics so tricky is that traditional guidelines for visualization warn us against 3D space. 3D pie charts like this distort perceived percentages. We can see other issues in other 3D charts, such as trying to localize individual points, like trying to find a point in this cloud in the scanner plot, um, or trying to estimate heights in a 3D projection, especially an angled 3D projection, or even having elements in a 3D graph occlude each other. So we can't actually see where certain data is. And in part, not using 3D is kind of conventional design wisdom and visualization. It's one of those, if I'm going to soapbox and evangelize, it's up there with our rainbow color map distinctions. But lately, people have been asking if immersive spaces may reopen this channel for visualization. So some of the leading figures in the field think otherwise. Um, so here's a talk from a leading figure in immersive analytics in DataViz that generally prescribes data guidelines for immersive analytics. And some of these might start to feel a little counterintuitive given the affordances of immersive devices. For example, the idea that 3D won't help or 3D navigation is hard when we do that all the time in the real world. So we wanted to test how well these ideas hold up in practice. And the way we did this is by running a study comparing 
how these practices work on 2D desktop displays to virtual reality to fully immersive augmented reality. And we looked across a range of different encoding choices, looking at things like color, size, orientation, height, and depth. And we looked at those in the context of both 2D and 3D scatter plots, trying to figure out how accurate are people across a series of four different statistical tasks, how quickly can they conduct those tasks, and also how much do they interact with the charts? How much do they choose to move about in space? So here are our key results. There's way too much to unpack here briefly. So I'm just gonna jump ahead and show you some examples of what these led to. But the takeaway is that what works in your desktop condition may not be what works in VR, which may not be what works in AR. So we need to critically think about how might our visualization design need to change as a function of the platforms we're working on. Um, so one of the things we've found is that stereo viewing actually allowed us to resolve depth ambiguities. So things like a 3D scatter plot with size variation or a 3D bar chart, which were not very effective in a desktop condition, actually performed quite well once we threw them into a stereoscopic immersive display like a VR or AR headset. Another thing that we found is that augmented reality makes color less effective, which is probably not surprising. When we put colors against different backgrounds, it actually changes our perception of what that color is. We get these different kinds of contrast illusions that can make us see a color that's not actually there. But one of the benefits of looking into augmented reality was that we actually saw that it substantially increased engagement. People were much more willing to interact with and move around in their data in augmented reality than they were in either virtual or augmented reality. So the key takeaway here is that we need new design intuitions for data visualization in immersive spaces. Just taking the rules that we have from, from our traditional 2D, plopping them in 3D, isn't gonna give us what we want. And so why do we need these ideas? Well, we're exploring how does immersion allow us to take data and bring it into the field, to bring it into the context it, it describes. So we conducted a series of interviews with people who do both field work and emergency response, so wildland firefighting in particular. And we found consistently that one of the two biggest barriers to using data in field practices were time and space. That data is stale by the time we get our hands on it, and it's also removed from the context it describes and the place that we can actually act on that data. So what we did is we constructed a preliminary prototype called FieldView, where we have a mobile phone application that allows us to do synchronized data collection. So we can take images, lat long, um, GPS positioning, all sorts of other connections to sensors, et cetera. We can put all this data into a digital field notebook, and then we synchronize that up to the cloud. And once we've got our data synchronized, we can pull it down and get all the data from our team and actually project that analysis either onto a mobile visualization or onto physical space based on alignment of the GPS coordinates. And so what we did is we embodied these, um, these visualizations across three common scenarios that people mentioned for wanting to work with data in the fields in an open source toolkit that combines mobile application, a portable router and an augmented reality headset. And what these different solutions that we came up with looked at were things like local team coordination. How can I supervise a team of people collecting data across a field site? Data quality, how can I see this data as it's coming in in real time and ensure and quickly identify places where data might be missing or where data might have errors or have gotten stale. And also looking at drone and sensor data. If I have a drone that's collecting aerial imagery, I might wanna be able to both get a sense of what's going on from my um, aerial perspective to inform my on the ground decision making, but also to see where exactly do I have data and where might I need to send that drone next. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the videos for this and just kind of jump to, whoops, if I can find my mouse, sorry, there we go. Um, well, I guess the video is played this far, so might as well go through a little bit of it now. So what we can see here is that we're updating the data, we're adding new information, and as we add new information, the blue squares out in the field are going to kind of start to disappear. So we're going to see more and more of this information populating in this grid at real time. We see the same kind of thing here with our aerial overhead drone imagery, where we have the locations of our drone images in the field site represented by the dots in these peripheral bars, where the size of these dots indicates how close to me 
that data is, and I can pop up that image in context by selecting it in the headset. So where are we going from here? Um, we have some work that we're doing at the National Science Foundation looking at how we can expand the integration of situated analytics with robotics in emergency response applications. And we also are doing some work thinking about how can we actually adapt our visualizations such that they are optimized for the environments that we're working in. Um, again, for the sake of time, that's all I'm gonna talk about today. Happy to find time to chat about that more if folks are interested. Uh, but I just wanna wrap by teasing a little bit of other ongoing work. Um, so we have a whole range of research moving beyond just these three threads, looking at things like how do we foster better data science literacy, more inclusive data science, including how do we design representations for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, turns out that the um, needs of people with cognitive disabilities for visualization design are dramatically different from those of most users. And so this is a new space for us to start exploring or investigating how we might connect other devices like robotics in visualization and even thinking about how do we foster um, literacy and engagement with data with physical computing as well. Uh, so with that, my apologies again for the technical difficulties and delays at the start. I just want to take a moment to thank my collaborators on this work and the our funding sources, and thank you all for listening. Great. Thanks very much, Danielle. Um, we only have like three minutes for questions. Sorry about that. That, yeah. was a, that was a packed, packed talk. But uh, so maybe if anyone's got a, a really quick question, um, uh, go ahead and ask it. Um, uh, or otherwise, um, you can maybe get in touch with Danielle. Um, uh, by email um, and, and follow up that way. Uh, does anyone have a very quick question? Andy, there's two questions in the chat. Okay. Three questions. So this is uh, from um, Siri Joda. Um, a simple question regarding visualizing the path of color ramp in uh, L, A, and B space, yes. which you represented using 2D spots uh, or plots. Um, I would want to see a path in 3D viz where the user can pan, zoom, rotate, or inspect and compare, I guess. Is, is that available in the tools that you produce? It is not right now. We initially prototyped that and it turned out to be extraordinarily difficult for people to use. Uh, but one thing that we have been playing with and keeps getting kind of kicked down the road is thinking about can we actually, in the interest of just really having fun with things, can we put these 3D curves into a VR headset and actually let people design and walk through their encoding designs that way. So it's one of those that may not be super practical, but we think it'll be a lot of fun, but we don't currently have an implementation that allows people to walk through the 3D curve. Great. Okay. Well, in the interest of time, I'm gonna I'm gonna call it there. But once again, thank you very much, Danielle. Um, I will uh, I, I will certainly be in contact because um, I think we work that I'm doing with uh, with some people in geography on on sea ice analysis. Um, it could be very very useful. So uh, thank you very much, and hopefully other people have been inspired similarly. So once again, thank you very much, Danielle, and thank you everyone else for turning up. Thanks, and uh, my apologies again for the, the late start, but do feel free to reach out after the fact. Happy to chat with folks. Great, thank you. Thank you. Danielle.